What is going on in the crypto market in 2022? Here is the answer from Alexander Waltigoya, CEO of CoinPanion. So it's nowadays, like beginning with millennials and going down with Gen Y and Gen Z, people are practically born with their phone in their hand. And there are lots of studies also, if you ask like Gen Zs, so people who are like, I don't know, um, up to 16, um, 18, something like that. If you ask them whether they feel more comfortable, more themselves, they, their response over 50% was that they say they feel more comfortable, more themselves online than offline. So our lives are shifting into the digital area. And I think this metaverse is a bit of like the alignment, but also a bit find the future. Alexander Waltingoyer is CEO of the crypto fintech Coin Penion. He was already intensively involved with cryptocurrencies during his school days, which led him to actively work on various projects in this scene. The first project he developed was a Bitcoin PayPal marketplace. Later in his studies, he started actively trading cryptocurrencies and also worked on his own ICO, for which he spoke on the panel at the C Free Crypto Conference in Berlin. After that, Alexander founded a sole proprietorship for software services. For about four years, Alexander has been intensively involved with the financial markets and, due to his skills, was also a trader on the previous version of CoinPanion. CoinPanion has now grown into a company with 30 plus employees and aims to help everyone get started in the crypto market with smart portfolios. Innovative technologies are reshaping our world all the way from decentralized banking systems to digital art. With Companion, you can join this revolution by investing in the world of tomorrow. We are talking about digital natives and the boomer generation, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, the biggest wealth transfer in human history, NFTs, Web3 and the metaverse and much, much more. I hope you enjoy the show the same way as I did. Welcome to a new episode of the Beginner's Mind podcast. Today with one of the best topics ever at this time of the year, <laughs> cryptocurrencies. And I'm very happy today to have as a special guest, uh, Alexander. Um, how should I spell your Waltingoyer. second name? Yeah. Walting, Waltingoyer. Waltingoyer yes, from Austria. <laughs> <laughs> Where does the name come from? It's like I'm from South Tyrol. Um, mm. Yeah, it, it's a South Tyrolian name, but not really common. Let's let's call it like that. It's like I actually researched once how the people on LinkedIn and on Facebook who have the same, uh, same um, last name than me. Mm. Oh, I have to drink it. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, the last time meet. And I kind of figured out they are somehow all related to me, like to my grand, grand, grandparents. So mm -hmm. I never dig deeper, but it's an uncommon name. <laughs> so it's a typical uncommon name from South Tyrol, uh, directly from the mountainous area in Austria. With uh, yeah. It's really beautiful. In Italy, yeah. in Italy. Italy, yeah, yeah. But um, I think <laughs> we have a common history. Tyrol, South, North, Northern Tyrol, mm -hmm. I think the... Uh, the, the people there still see their commonalities. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So I would definitely say we have like our own definition of culture in South Tyrol. So mm -hmm. it's really this mixture of Italy and Austria. But mm -hmm. you feel the Austrian impact and you feel the Italian impact and it's mixed up to its own culture. But yeah, you're for sure related to Austria. That's also the reason a lot of South Tyrolians move to Austria, mm -hmm. but also a lot of South Tyrolians move down to Italy. So I would say it's a unique place in that regards. Central Europe generally is a great melting place. It reminds me of my, um, uh, in the town where I went to university, Graz. It also had some Mediterranean influence, some um, uh, influence from Slovenia, Croatia, also Italy. And when I go further southwards, we still see the Austrian influence. So it's all, I think it's it's one of the best regions to live in, especially I mean, when I think about South Tyrol, beautiful mountains, beautiful lakes. It's uh, amazing to be <laughs> Great food. Yeah, no, I liked it there. Yeah. Let's, now now in Vienna. Yeah, Vienna is also, a, is also a great city to be in in the heart of Europe, they say. Definitely. Let's jump to the topic of today's podcast episode. 
Um, when we agreed on the recording, I think uh, it was somewhere in October, November last year, I just remember the, uh, the monikers on the social media channels like YouTube, Michael Saylor, I think his highest price prediction for Bitcoin was 1 million, Raul Paul, Ethereum will go to 30,000. And we all were so sure that uh, by tomorrow, we will be all extremely rich. And the only way cryptocurrencies can, can go is up. And now, two months or three months later, uh, we are at the end of January 2022. We see a little bit of uh, not the central land, I would say disaster land in cryptocurrency. I think <laughs> many of the crypto investors see their first uh, bear market or a glimpse into a bear market with a huge crash. How do you perceive the development of the last three months? Hmm. Yeah, it's actually super interesting. I think there was definitely a lot of ivory in the market. So you could feel this for sure. It, it was a formal driven market. So like a lot of people were had a fear of missing out and wanted to get in as quickly as possible. I guess it wasn't only the case for um, cryptocurrencies. I also definitely think so it was for tech stocks and generally investing. Like I would say more risky assets all got a, a bit bumped now in the last couple of weeks and months. Um, yeah, it's all it's like I, I'm never a big fan of price predictions. I, I think I also mentioned that in the fir first talk we had. So I never do like really hard price predictions. I think like oh, Bitcoin is going to 100,000 US dollars by the end of the year. I think nobody knows where the market is going, especially mm -hmm. short term. Mm -hmm. So I feel like often these price predictions are really based on what is going to happen in the next year. And I feel like one year is just um, too short of a um, time frame to really make a prediction because nobody knows if the market is going up, down, sideways or in circles. Nobody knows it. And there's so many external factors which influences the market environment, especially short term. Now it's like with um, like interest rates that should get increased again. So the markets are moving around. We have some troubles in Ukraine. So there are a lot of um, different things happening in, a, in, a, in, a, in short time frames, which influences the market, which influences the emotions. And I feel like especially short terms, markets are often influenced um, by emotions. So, so what I like always to see, uh, say is, like I also posted on LinkedIn, I think a couple of weeks ago, don't get over invested and don't get crazy about market movements, which happened in the last couple of weeks or months. My best, I, 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 won't, I, I won't say advice because I'm not giving financial advice, but I feel like the best strategy in my opinion is always just make a savings plan, invest for a couple of years, don't think too much about short-term movements. Because in the end, if you really believe in the um, investment thesis, it's going to go up. And I'm like, I'm like sure that Bitcoin is going to get way, way higher than it's now. I just don't know if it's in one or two or three years, but I know it's going to be in 10 years plus. And the, I, I'm like the same opinion with crypto. I'm the same opinion with NFTs. I'm the same opinion with the DeFi market. I'm the same opinion with the stocks, tech stocks market. So I think That's, all these are like super interesting markets. It's always like super hard to say where it's going to go tomorrow. Yes, let's let's stay a bit with the long-term perspective of the crypto market. I went, uh, I mean, I'm 47 years old and I went through a lot of uh, euphoria and fear cycles. Uh, when I think back on the beginning of the internet, um, was 1994, 1995, uh, there was also a euphoria until 2000 where um, everybody thought we are at the beginning of a new area like uh, making everybody rich and then 2000 2001 happened and a lot of people said where did that come from <laughs> so nobody expected <laughs> it and looking at amazon for example in 2000 2001 i think the price of amazon dropped by 90 percent within a couple of months and now when we look at amazon uh it's it's still one of the biggest and greatest companies in the world and jeff bezos i think is number two or number three meanwhile mm -hmm. of the richest people in the world um when i look at 2007 and 8 we had a similar scenario mm -hmm. the prices on the stock market went up again and suddenly Nobody expected such a crash. Uh, it happened. And then we had a very long bull run with short interruptions and um, I would say flash crashes. So they happened quite frequently. Uh, in your opinion, when I look at the cryptocurrency ecosystem that evolved since uh, I think 2008-9 when Bitcoin was invented, uh, where do you see the long-term perspective in this ecosystem? Long-term perspective of this ecosystem. So I think especially a lot happened in the last one and a half, two years mm -hmm. in the cryptocurrency market, 
with actual adoption happening in the DeFi and NFT space. In my opinion, especially this NFT um, thematic around crypto is one of the killer applications of long-term um, adoption. And you also kind of saw there's a, there was a lot of venture capital, a lot of investment money pu um, pu um, put into companies building web-free applications. So I think now, I mean, like I, I exactly agree um, what you said. There's always euphoria in the market, which drives the market up pretty quickly. But then people kind of find out, okay, it, we are not there yet. So it's always like, we have think, I feel like a lot of people always have this perception, we're in the future tomorrow. And I'm going to invest now because tomorrow it's going to happen. But it takes some time because things are developed and adoption is happening. Um, yeah, again, back to the long-term perspective of e the ecosystem. I think we are now in the um, adoption phase of a lot of applications in the cryptocurrency space. In the last couple of years, it was a lot, okay, we have this beautiful technology which you can use in different um, different fields of, of your life. We could use it in the banking system. We could cut out middleman, et cetera, et cetera. There was a lot of dreams in it. But I feel like, especially now with this web-free domain, which is happening, that we say, okay, we are entering a new, um, new, um, new area of internet. That's actually the killer application for crypto. And I think from there, it will then expand more and more in different areas of our lives. So what, what I see is two trends currently, which influence the crypto um, ecosystem. One is definitely, how, um, if you look at the digitization of our generation. So it's nowadays, like beginning with millennials and going down with Gen Y and Gen Z, people are practically born with their phone in their hand. And there are lots of studies also, if you ask like Gen Zs, so people who are like, I don't know, um, up to 16, um, 18, something like that. If you ask them whether they feel more comfortable, more themselves, their they response over 50% was that they say they feel more comfortable, more themselves online than offline. So our lives are shifting into the digital area. And I think this metaverse is a bit of like alignment, but also a bit find the future. But we definitely see this trend of people becoming more and more digital. I mean, we're doing the podcast digital, I'm communicating digital. I'm in a lot of um, forums and communities, digital where I exchange ideas. So a lot of our life is happening digital. I think that's like this, this first adoption phase. We say, okay, we are as humans more, more than 50% digital because we have our digital identity, our digital exchange and our digital self, basically. And the second thing is, which is happening now is the adoption of the system that we have digital ownership because people always want to express themselves. They want to have ownership. So they want to say, okay, I have my beautiful car. I have my paintings, I have my clothing. So I see that's one of the things which is happening with the technology. And with gaming, we already had it like seeing gaming items that you have your guns, which have your skin. You have your avatar, which I don't know, have some items to play, play around. And now it's going to go broader in the whole cultural area of digitalization. So the first thing is, okay, I basically have crypto as the info layer, which is connecting with all these different platforms. And basically my crypto wallet is myself, like my ownership, like my house, my car, my keys, my wallets. My wife. Huh? <laughs> my house, my car, my keys, my wife. So Yes, basically. <laughs> with extraordinary, uh, but yeah, it, it's going in that direction. I definitely believe so. And I actually experienced it also myself because I see it how I grew up with gaming a lot. And I see how this is also like moving in my generation area. And I see this is happening. And I think that's the first wave that we say are now in this cultural adoption. And the next wave is users are uh, usage adoption, where we see it happening with implementation of um, um, companies like Meta, um, X Facebook, mm. Microsoft, and other big players, which try to put also like more than cultural value, but actual usage value to these tokens. For example, what is happening a lot now is currently also um, access to private communities that so you have your tokens like the Diners Club in real club, in real life. You have your tokens that you can access exclusive communities. That was always a thing and it's going to be a thing in the digital area. Or that you have access to specific concerts, movies, that you have content. And I think content is going to be bigger and bigger and bigger. The more we automate other stuff, the more content is created. Um, and crypto is basically then the usage and the access keys to that. And this movement is happening currently. But it's in the early phase. And also going to, to show how early we are. I mean, there's a lot of venture capital money, meaning there's a lot of companies co which committed to it, but the market is at 40 to 60 billion total um, market capitalization. I mean, that's like Activision Blizzard, which was bought by Microsoft, like a small company just bought by a bigger company. That's the whole NFT market and still people get crazy about it. So 
I think we are super, super early in that phase. I think we also are a bit in a bubble in the NFT space. I don't think the value should be that high, especially for the use cases which we have currently. But I see um, that there's a lot of development happening. I see there's a lot of the, um, adoption happening. And I, and I think with all these technologies basically playing around and uh, like a VR, um, like this whole metaverse, AI, robotics, that we all combine these technologies, especially with 5G and the, and the generational shift that this crypto market is basically going to be thrown like up <laughs> like a rocket with it, basically. So I would say it's it's... It's always hard with time frames, but 10 years and 10 years, I think it's going to be in every aspect of our lives, somehow a token which represents ownership in a digital ecosystem. I I totally agree to that. I mean, uh, before 1994, I think uh, the digital world was restricted to uh, one computer maximum per household, not connected to anything else. Then I think we had these uh, Blu-rays and uh, CD-ROMs and uh, discs, uh, 3.5 inches or uh, 5.25 inches. And before 1970, I think there was nothing. So I really see it evolving and developing, maybe not at that speed like some influencers would like to see it coming. Yeah, I also think it's a bit like the, the euphoria and the expectations are too high currently. Yeah. But there's a lot happening in different industries, which will eventually play together. I think especially a big issue is currently cloud computing. How can you access mm. this fast? Because like computing power is important for all these ecosystems. And how can you like get it like live stream, basically? That's mm. that's one of the killer applications in that sense. But this is happening. I mean, we see so many developments in so many areas. And from, from my like personal understanding, it's definitely that we are moving this digital, digital area. The generation is is, uh, is growing up in it already and technology is um, catching up so fast that this is like, yeah, it's like 100% sure that it's going to happen. <laughs> I, I, I see, I see, I see, the, I see the ball rolling as well. So it's rolling in the future, but maybe uh, for my generation, let's stay a little bit with the basics. And you mentioned <laughs> a few, a few terms and I would like to pick three of these to shine more light on that. So the first one is NFT. What is NFT all about? Yes. So NFT basically means non-fungible token, and it's a digital representation of ownership and uniqueness. So kind of, I mean, it's always simple to show it with art. That's what's one of the um, first use cases of it. But we can imagine it like that. You can have unlimited copies of the Mona Lisa, which look 100% alike, but you only have one original, which is really the original um, Mona Lisa with the value and the culture connection to it. Mm. And that's the same. Uh, and that, that's how we have in real life. We have serial numbers and we know, okay, this person built that and that's the original. There's only one piece. In the digital area, there's a, like there was always this issue of uniqueness because I can copy paste movies as many one uh, as many times I want. I have images I can copy paste them as many times as I want. With gaming already like in a central way, they solved it that you, just the game maker just says, okay, there's no more. But then we had no interoperability. Mm -hmm. And what NFTs basically are doing now is they're abusing basically blockchain technology, a decentralized system of consensus to um, define, okay, uniqueness to a specific item. So I can say, okay, for example, the artist creates a picture like of a digital art piece and connects it to NFT. And we have the general consensus that this is the original with true blockchain technology. This is like a um, uncentralized um, system where we kind of define, okay, this is technology. We trust the technology. There's nobody uh, manipulating it. And our general consensus is that we trust this technology. It's the same that we somehow trust also a museum that this is the original Mona Lisa, right? To a certain degree, just with blockchain, we actually have the technical proof that it is. So I think that's that's the connection a bit of it. We have this technology, which makes sure there is just one. We have the consensus are written. Basically, the token represents this digital item. You always can then use centralized, um, centralized system to display it or to use it, but it's this token which gives you the access to the usage of it. For example, also like a key or a specific key which can open specific doors and no other keys can open it. And we have this digital version of it. Yeah, all this new technology, I think, need a little bit of explanation. Um, when I think, I mean, I love reading, you see it here. So <laughs> there are some books. <laughs> and uh, before 1994, before Amazon came on the market with the Kindle app, so before I think in 2010 or 2011, uh, the only way to get books was in this form. It was just, just like from Red yeah, physical. physical books. So 
Then came the, uh, Jeff Bezos and said, okay, you can make uh, this book not only into a PDF file, you can also put it on a Kindle in an app. So it's for reading. And I immediately saw the value of it because when I want to travel, and I mean, books this size, so I can carry one or two with me. And when I have my Kindle with me, I can have my entire, entire library accessible for me all the time. But the problem that came with that is... Uh, I cannot sell digital books. So, for example, when I read Ray Dalio's book and uh, I want to change it with a friend and say, okay, I give you my one of mine and you give me one of yours, I can do it with the physical books. But I never found a way to do it with digital ebooks in Because, in the system system. Centralized. because yeah. basically Amazon is owning that system and that's yeah. breaking down. It's like a lot of creators, I think this is a, a really a creator-driven um, solution to this issue is, I say, okay, my book is that token. You have access to that book through the token. And now you can just trade it like every, everything else because we have an ownership model, which is not connected to a central institution. It's not Facebook, Meta, Amazon, whoever controlling that system. It's basically the blockchain. Blockchain is a decentralized system, so nobody owns it. So do, do we understand you right? So basically the writer, the author of a book, the creator can use the NFT technology, let's call it that way, uh, to make uh, unique copies of yes. one digital book. And he can sell these books then to readers and the readers have a unique version and can then exchange the unique version with other readers and say, okay, I give you one of my digital NFT books and you give me one of yours. For example, that's definitely working. And you can also go a bit like wider. You can also say, okay, this is the first version where only five were released, like the first one, you see it in a token. Then you have like a second copy, which is not that, um, which is more common. So it has less value because pe people say, okay, I want to have the first version. So you also have that system. And also for the creator, you can like implement cool systems. Like every time the book resets, he gets a part of the earnings. So also creators are more incentivized to do it. This would be the, the, the second question I have with smart contracts. Let's stay a little bit with the, with the NFT first, because yeah. I, it works in real life. And I think uh, famous people, for example, I mean, just imagine that um, Bill Gates is an avid reader. Uh, when he sells books he has read and with his notes in it, uh, I'm pretty sure there's a market for that. And uh, I'm pretty sure that also for, for famous books, the first uh, the first version of Moby Dick, for example, mm -hmm. or the first version of Ernest Hemingway, I mean, they have a price on the market. And so what NFT, and please correct me if I'm wrong, what NFT is doing is just replicating what works in the real world into the digital world. So now all digital books are unique and I can purchase uh, the first version of a book or the first NFT of a book. I can also make notes in the book and transfer the entire book in a unique way to the next reader. Yes. Is that right understanding? Exactly. exactly. That's possible. Like you said, you can add notes. You can see who read that book before. So it's also like a history behind that digital version of the book. And you can like do nice additions to it. Like it can be a key to so the it's like unlimited potential. I mean, I mean, let's stay a little bit with that because yeah. this is interesting. Sorry. I am always like going to... Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, just, I just interrupt you. Sorry for that. Yeah. But with, with this kind of books, for example, uh, Ray Dalio's book, just mm -hmm. imagine, uh, I mean, I'm pretty sure Warren Buffett read a lot of books to become one of the big, best investors. And I'll just imagine, I mean, 100 years in the future and an investor uh, reads a book who then becomes famous and you own a version that were owned by these investors. So I think this would be a tremendous uptake in value. And with an NFT, you can really make it traceable so that you see who were the owners in the history of one particular book, because this is completely different to the real world. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, I would say it basically takes what the real world, the world has, like this uniqueness, this exchangeability, and adds a couple of layers to it because it's, because it's data, you can extend it in many ways. So like you really have a history who read that book. Um, you can add additional features to it. Like you basically can make this book exchange that the author always get, get something. So you can also like add long-term content to it automatically. I think if, I think this is the second interesting part. What you mentioned is smart contracts. Mm -hmm. uh, because when I, when I buy this physical book, let's take like Ray again and make some, <laughs> some studies for him. Um, I think by copyright law, I'm not allowed to commercially resell that book. So I might be, as a private person, I might be might be able that I can sell it at the same price or 
to another friend, but I'm not allowed to do it commercially. But Ray Dalio will never get a cent out of it. So if I resell that book, uh, first I have to check, of course, if it's legal and if it's possible, if mm-hmm. don't recommend it to anything illegal. But okay. Ray Dalio won't see anything. And uh, as far as I understand your explanation around the smart contracts, you tackled into it a bit, bit yeah. briefly. When this would be a digital version, you can design a smart contract around the NFT that makes sure that the writer always get a certain percentage, for example, 10% of the reselling. Is that the right understanding yeah. of smart yes. contracts? Basically, yes. Yeah, you, you can do it like that. Basically, what a smart contract is, it just automates an agreement between two parties. So let's say we two agree, um, hey, I'm going to give you my book, but if you sell it to somebody else, I get 10%. But normally in the real life, I would just have to trust you that you give me that 10%. But because it's code, we automate you, the middleman, we just basically can just like yeah. directly send it to me. And we can like, th- this idea of automating trust contracts basically can go way broader again. We can basically remove all, all the middlemen you can imagine can theoretically be automated away with smart contracts. Like why do you need a bank, which is just me uh, moving basically money and assets between a couple of parties, we can just do it code wise, theoretically. Mm-hmm. Or I, I don't, I, I, I don't uh, personally I think it's it's not replacing the middleman. I think it's just increasing trust between the parties. Let's just let's just stay at, at the book example okay. for, for 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 a second to, to ensure that I have the right understanding. And I'm tapping now right into your know how and knowledge. It is far better than mine is. Mm-hmm. Um, Ray Dalio, for example, he wrote the book. And let's imagine Warren Buffett bought it and Warren Buffett became famous. I'm pretty sure the, the price goes up. So with your example, it means if Warren Buffett then takes this book and say, this book made me famous and I became the best investor because of this book, uh, he then could potentially sell it not for $20, but for $1 million. Yes. And the smart contract behind it uh, make sure that Ray Dalio gets 10% of this 1 million, just a, just a, just a blunt number. Um, when the purchase is a library, for example, uh, mm-hmm. this would be the middleman then. You, know, you put it in the library um, and the book sits there and says, look, I mean, we bought this. Warren Buffett is, uh, is recorded as the owner. It made him famous. Here you have the statement. It's also an NFT. And you can rent this book for a limited period of time and you can read it. And also in that case, it would make sure that Ray Dalio gets 10% of the rental fees then. So you rent it out. If you you build it all on blockchain technology, yes, you can can build it like that. You can also then basically library could also do a smart contract that you can read it for 10 days and then the token automatically goes back to their wallet. And then the um, reader has no access to it anymore. And I think the issue of giving back the book, you can automate it. I think the problem in real life is not the middleman. It's just the complexity of executing commission-based contracts at scale in real life. Mm -hmm. Uh, And when you you, uh, replace it with a digital version, it's it's automated. So in real life, I mean, just imagine a library. They have uh, hundreds of thousands of books, big library. Uh, they would need to track in real life every single transaction, which practically is impossible. So it's 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 uh, yeah. not. I agree to a certain extent because in that example, you basically could just automate away the library with code. So you could, for example, send that book of Ray Dalio to a smart contract, and then basically just ask a smart contract, this- "I want to read it." And then um, I get it for 10 days and pay a commission to a smart contract, which automatically sends yeah. it to Ray Dalio. So and I don't I've- need the library which makes the market more efficient to a degree. And I think this is the, the, the unique invention around this NFT smart contract space uh, that your first time in the human history, you have this possibility. Uh, yeah. I think before with paper contracts, it was next to impossible. I mean, when you go back 30 years in time, so 30, it's not much, it's 30 years in human society, there were no computers. So it would have really meant people would have needed to sit down and go through paper contracts at scale and pay out 10 cent and 20 cent and 30 cent to this and that person in a world which that was mostly used to physical currency and not digital currency. Now with smart contract, we have a lot more possibilities. It doesn't necessarily mean to replace the middleman, but the middleman can execute the smart contracts at scale very efficient. So just yeah. in, the, in the library case, I mean, it's 10 cent, 20 cent, but it uh, builds up for the writer. So when 100 libraries are doing the, the same thing and making sure that the writer every time gets a commission, it's a great work. Yeah. Like I, I agree to the extent that I think the middleman can just be code in that 
that mm-hmm. that example. I, I think in a, some some cases it always makes sense to have a middleman if it's more like really specific knowledge base or you do a service. Mm-hmm. I think especially for service, but if it's just being the intermediate between two people which try to exchange something, then in my opinion you don't need it. Um, you what what you mentioned also before, like with the smart commissions, that's like a, a lot of work. I mean, you could automate that also in uh, in a centralized way, but then do you have the um, system of interoperability, the issues mm-hmm. of interoperability? And I think also that's a, that's one of the key um, ideas behind NFTs. We agree on that standard. We have the technology. We use the decentralized system as as the base, and that's the standard. And everybody can access it and basically build on top of that. So I I don't like. With a, with a centralized system, we would have, again, a digital copy, which I, I write in a database. I have to trust you in the database. It's not transparent. Then you can do it through database, and everybody has his own system. But with um, with tokens, I basically have that standard. It's in blockchain, and I don't need centralized systems to do it. And that makes it more efficient, uh, efficient on a large, a large scale. And that's actually also super interesting, what you mentioned before, with the smart commissions, with the, with the idea of Internet of Things. So you could like also implement these token systems with um, like really super smart transactions in the 000.1 um, cent um, area. So which is never efficient to do for a centralized institution. But if you block or not just in scale, like in large scale, and then you have again the issue of centralized um, ownership. But you could like automate a lot of these things also with crypto or like blockchain. I, I agree to everything you said. Just when I was smiling, I had this idea of uh, this recording, for example. I mean, just imagine you become famous 30 years down the road. You're the Austrian Jeff Bezos. Um, <laughs> uh, created similar wealth like him, but out of Austria, which is uh, mm-hmm. very challenging. And I have the first recording of this interview. So as an NFT, would that be possible to also use that podcast, that podcast awesome. episodes? Okay. Yeah, you, you can easily do that. You connect an NFT to that and say, okay, this is the ownership of that video. Like like I said, you kind of have to define what's the use case of it. What I'm allowed to share the video and like do whatever I want. Then you basically have a use case to the NFT and you can sell it. So we, we did something similar at Companion. <laughs> we were like giving out um, over Christmas um, NFTs. Mm-hmm. So we uh, created um, like artworks and get, get, gifted them out like within our, like, how is it called? Um, this Christmas uh, Christmas calendar. You, you know what I mean? The zero to 24th until Christmas, you give out every day um, NFT. And the last one was actually, you have to write to meeting with me. So can you use that NFT for a meeting? And I said also, that, I mean, if nobody uses it and like, I, I'm, like I keep up my promise, but there's also some trust in it in the end, you could trade it around and that ownership of that contract goes around and if like the company becomes bigger i don't know i become a serial founder who who knows what happens then this increases in value and you have a, tra- a tradable good of it so to to a certain degree what also like this nfts and crypto kind of um, enables us is to make everything which has value tradable and exchangeable everything that has value becomes tradable and exchangeable even meeting slots yeah even meeting slots yeah, it makes sense. I mean, Warren Buffett, and just coming back to Warren Buffett, I think uh, for charity purposes, he sells uh, lunches with Warren Buffett yes. for, I think, $600,000 that I read on the internet. Depends so, on the bidding system, but yeah. Okay, well, so you can do basically that as an NFT and say, okay, every time when such a lunch is sold at a higher price than the previous one, uh, the entire Warren Buffett, of course, has to keep his promise then, mm-hmm. um, or similar person. And automatically, the proceed of the purchase is then transferred to the charity that's encoded into the smart contract. You can do it. Then it's trackable, traceable. Everybody sees what's happening, how much um, value created in the end, like for the charity. And you have the standard. So you can exchange it. For example, I could exchange my meeting with Warren Buffett with your meeting with Jeff Bezos, for example. <laughs> so, and with a smart contract, we don't have to trust each other. That yeah. I give you my token, then you don't give me the Jeff Bezos one. Is basically the smart contract. Just make sure, okay, we write a smart, a smart contract. It's like super easy. If Warren Buffett wallet arrive, um, token arrives at your wallet, Jeff Bezos wallet um, token arrives at my wallet. Done. So we also don't need like some trustee in the middle which takes both and then exchanges. We can just do it with code. We can exchange everything what we want. The minute I thought I got it for the creator community, for the creator, let's, let's call it ecosystem or economy, 
Uh, we have now new use cases connected more to the real world, but let's stay with the creator uh, community first and then go to the real world. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, when I think before the internet started, uh, creating something meant uh, movies, writing, or uh, uh, photography meant going becoming part of an industry and relying on these middlemen that you said that they make sure that uh, the art uh, also painting that's the art is distributed to the person now with the internet uh, something new arrived it was the creator economy and uh, i mean creating something online in the 90s like uh, blogging for example websites i mean it started with the internet uh there was no possibility to make money with that um, now, I think YouTube has a system for creators where they uh, pay for views. Also, Facebook has a similar system. TikTok has a similar system. Um, it's getting better for creators, online creators. And now with the NFT, I think it's the push in the, in, into the next level of the creator economy that they can, the creators can do a lot more with that. So making unique videos, encoding smart contracts into that. Is, that, is this the right summary for the creator economy, yeah. the power of energy? Yeah, I, I definitely see it like that. And I also think it's really um, a golden area for creators. I think a lot of time is just spent consuming content nowadays, especially with optimization. It's going to be more and more. And um, it makes the things also more efficient and more favorable for the creator because now you have a lot of middlemen always eating again. Like, for example, musicers, they are the rock record labels, which actually earn the big chunks. But if you do it to an NFT, you basically, okay, that's right. I sell it, I crowdfund it. And everybody who basically um, invested in it gets a share of the proceedings. It's a token again. So it makes a lot of things. Yeah. Like I said, it's the golden area of the creator economy. And you got it right. <laughs> no, I see, I see, I see, I mean, with music, I see the cash streams coming, uh, more cash streams coming to musicians than ever before. Um, Steve Jobs was one of the first ones who reorganized the music industry with uh, his iTunes approach, where it was possible to buy single songs yeah. from, from a compact disc before it was necessary to buy 10 to 15 songs on a compact disc to just listen to one. And then Steve Jobs invented the iPods and iTunes, and I could start purchasing single songs, which I believe in the end created more cash streams because mm. uh, I didn't buy for single songs uh, an entire compact disc out of uh, cash reasons back in the 90s as a student. Um, when I look now at the NFT space, uh, I think one cr point of criticism was like Spotify, for example. I mean, you need a lot of downloads from Spotify to make money as a musician. Mm -hmm. um, but with NFT, each, songs, uh, each song becomes an original. So musicians then can also tr start trading the original uploads to Spotify and can create cash streams around that platforms. Is that a possible scenario? Yeah. Theoretically, yes, yes. Um, I think to a certain degree, um, NFTs become commodities. Like everything will be somehow tokenized and you can do so many crazy things of it. Like really, okay, that's the right of the music. Um, that they earn the earnings, but you can also say the first play is an own NFT in itself and it um, shows the first like play ever happened. Then you can trade that again. I'm I'm staying with these questions a bit longer uh, because I think this is the, the unique turn that we have in 2022 and 2021, or we had in 2021, mm -hmm. uh, compared to 2017 when the, the last, uh, let's say, crypto euphoria um, came to the market. I didn't see any use cases back then. So, I mean, basically it was buy cryptocurrencies. And whenever I asked the question, okay, what can I do with it? What's the use case behind it? The only use case I got offered was you can buy and hold it and you can sell it. And that was it basically. And from, 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 but... I mean, it's my, it's, my, it's my blunt understanding because I started doing research in cryptocurrencies uh, more professionally back in 2017. So the first, there was nothing, there was nothing like by, just buying and holding basically. Now, when I talk with the experts like you, uh, they come up with a lot of ideas for use cases, what you can do with that, or what the technology is capable of doing. And this is a, a game changing, a game changer in the entire industry. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about NFTs, we talked about smart contracts. And in my opinion, uh, such ideas, how we can use smart contracts, how we can use NFTs didn't exist back in 2017. There actually was one really good idea, which um, because of that boom, um, got a bit got a lot of criticism the ico model mm -hmm. so um, the, uh, the general idea that i can raise funds with um, 
usage and value within the platform so that I sell future value of the platform to a token and get proceedings now uh, in as a company. I think that is actually a genius model. Mm-hmm. It's not that used anymore nowadays, which I'm a bit surprised because I feel like it's overdue to happen again because it makes sense for a lot of um, business models. In, in but I think that was one of the good applications of, okay, we build platforms and we have to give our to- uh, tokens for access value within the platform. Um, but it didn't have this breakthrough because there was too much hype and too little applications which were then actually built. Because, okay, I give you a token, you can do whatever then on the platform, but the platform was nothing. So, I think yeah. I think what was missing with the ICO model was something like an NFT. I remember the talks I had back in 2017 to 2019 around ICOs. Um, it was used by companies that didn't have anything to do with the crypto space. I mean, it was life science, so it was digital health companies. And they had the idea to use token uh, to replace equity round, investment rounds. Yeah. So when an investor invests in a company and buys equity, the investor has a guaranteed share in the company. And the odd thing with a few of these ICOs that I saw were that uh, investors who purchased that token that was unique to that company couldn't do anything with the token. It didn't uh, even uh, guarantee a share in the company. So it was basically yeah. uh, more or yeah, less a that. future promise of revenues, but it uh, didn't guarantee ownership. And I think with the NFTs now, the game changes because NFT now are produced in a way that they guarantee ownership to an asset. So now with the NFT, you see the theoretical potential to streamline even equity rounds or yeah. business yeah. angel rounds. Yeah, um, that wouldn't then, um, not necessarily be an NFT because it's, it's not unique. You can have like multiple shares of it. Right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> but but yeah, talk, um, that's actually already happening. Like tokenized shares is something which is currently developing a lot, especially with this classic models. Like with creators, we have a bit more flexibility because there's not so much regulation. But uh, for equity rounds, we have, yeah, we have a lot of regulation around who's the owner. It's not that easy to replicate on tokens. In Germany, we now have a new law since like, I think two or three months where we have the token registry. Uh-huh. So you can um, put financial instruments on tokens. So you have a register that's written. So it will need some, some more work on the regulatory side that we have this classic um, ownership models also based as a token. But that's going to definitely happen because the token in its, ultima, uh, in its ultimate state is just the perfect standard layer to do it. I mean, the, 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 I mean, uh... I think it is coming because the, the the problem that I saw with this, I see still with the private rounds is they are expensive. Um, on one hand, um, when I look at business angels here in Austria or in Central Europe, the usual, I think, uh, round uh, participation of a business angel is between 10,000 to 150,000 euros per round. Uh, 250,000, in my opinion, is on the higher end, which just needs to uh, have a look on the, on, the, on the distribution of wealth in the area. So the usual round sizes that make sense for business angels are more at the 10, 20, or 30,000. Uh, when you put two or three business angels for 100,000 in a company, you still have the same expenses, like uh, similar expenses, like going for a Series C for 10 million. Uh, tokens have a potential to make it easier, especially for private companies to exchange then the shares. I mean, uh, yeah. try to sell shares in a limited company here in Austria. It's still uh, very... Actually, that's something I was researching a couple of weeks ago. Mm-hmm. I was like researching a bit um, alternative investing models. So mm-hmm. for example, fractional ownership of collectibles, wine, digital race was like all these new crazy ideas about how we can like make everything investable. And an interesting concept I found, I don't know how they legally set it up, is, you know, like a lot of companies have these ESOP shares that you have like as an employee early stock options in the company and you create secondaries around it. Mm. It tokenizes and it could, for example, somebody could sell his co-student stock, which is still like an ESOP and buy a bit panda stock, which is also still an ESOP. And there, are, there is a lot happening in that direction. I think it's, but the, the main issue, like I mentioned before, there, is, there needs a bit more regulation because it's really, really hard. You always have to come up with strange constructs to like get it done that somehow you have this participation, but not really. It's a lot of these derivatives and loopholes. And I think you need a clearer batting ground. So also notary acts, for example, that they have to go to notary to like exchange um, in a limited company shares. You basically could automate it through blockchain because you have to prove who owns what and how it's exchanged. Like, 
it's even better than a paper which is somewhere stored but it's like the legal case is not there yet so that's also a blocking factor for it that's again why i think creator economies again the ones who are gonna like benefit from this whole, whole ecosystem the earliest because there's not that regulatory um like overload is happening when you create a song or create a picture. I totally agree to what you say. And I think also the governments and regulators already are aware of the situation that a lot is possible. A lot of uh, markets can be organized in a more efficient way using the technology. And they already started regulation processes, which in my opinion is a good thing. It's a good yeah. thing. It helps. It helps the end ecosystem. I definitely agree with it. Like when we, when we know the playing ground and have a, common regulation, ideally worldwide, but at least EU-wide, then we know how to build products which are scalable. And otherwise, you always have to maneuver national laws, which like really blocks innovation because it's always a, like a, um, a barrier which you have to overcome and then you solved it for, let's say, Germany, but it's not solved for um, Austria. And crypto and like NFT, Steve, or whatever, like crypto as a general, is actually a global concept. It's a global yeah. borderless concept. We just need a playing ground when we know, okay, this is, we can connect the, the real life assets to it. So it also goes into real life assets, but generally it's a global concept how you do it. Like every person in the internet is part of this ecosystem. I mean, for the, the, the questions and the brainstorming we are doing right now is for the listeners who ask, why should I buy cryptocurrencies these days? And uh, thinking about conversation in 2017, 18, as you said, I mean, there was this, uh, yes, you can do an ICO and that's it. Uh, there was one use case, one potential use case. And a year earlier, there was no, nothing. It was just buy and hold. And now we have a lot of ideas. <laughs> Except Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a known concept. <laughs> Let's come to that later. But now the ecosystem produces a lot of ideas, a lot of use cases. And uh, there is also investment capital flowing into this area, venture oh. capital. So it's growing, it's evolving, it's developing. And uh, we went, we have this third part open. We had NFT, we have smart contracts. And then you mentioned initially web free. Uh, and I would add slash metaverse. Is my understanding the same that web 3.0 and metaverse are exchangeable? <laughs> there is no real definition of metaverse and web free. <laughs> give me yours. Give me your definition. Up, uh, with its own definition to a certain degree, I wouldn't actually put them in, in the in the same bucket. Uh, I would I would try how I define it like really shortly. Mm -hmm. So the metaverse is for me my digital life. So my digital identity in an ecosystem where I can like where we can like communicate as a digital persona. So for example. I would say my Reddit name and my uh, that I exchange ideas with people in these forums, the Reddit Reddit system is basically a metaverse to some degree. Mm -hmm. And now it's going a bit um, like famous with the idea of VRs, which is for sure coming, but a bit more in the future. Web three uh, Web three point zero is for me more this ownership, this like wallet, this my my ownership in that ecosystem, which connects to different parts. So the metaverse is for me the room. And uh, like where I move around and communicate with people. And basically, um, Web3 free is basically my bag where I have all my stuff in it. Okay. In okay. Room. Okay. 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 Which can then connect, like, I don't know, I have my key card and I go to the Twitter metaverse, for example, <laughs> and enter something. And get, like the key card is on the Web3.0 that that concept I can enter. But the metaverse, when I'm then moving, like the room where I am then like exchanging ideas, communicate with people, basically live to a certain degree, is the metaverse in my definition. So web, web 3.0 then is uh, the technical layer, so the technical solution, yes. the bucket for uh, what technology is behind it. I, I would definitely define web 3 really as that ownership, like digital ownership. Mm -hmm. I can own stuff with this digital. And that's the new concept of web 3.0, which then interconnects. And the metaverse is really this, it's, it's an old idea, in my opinion, because Reddit, uh, Instagram, all these social networks already have it. But now it's like really, this digital, it's this digital space. And also this digital space, uh, space is involving with VR, like interconnections between communities. So it's really the digital living area. Yeah, I was uh, yesterday, I saw a post from uh, Linus Bellionas on LinkedIn, where mm -hmm. he showed uh, a concert in the metaverse and <laughs> edits the comment. <laughs> Uh, well, it, it, it looks like uh, uh, Fortnite or Call of Duty, less guns, uh, yeah. but we had that already years ago, uh, or like EverQuest without the fantasy. 
fantasy yeah, environment. Second Life, actually. That was like super early. Yes, and yes, that's true. Sim a similar concept. And also had like an own currency and ecosystem. Actually, I, I would say way ahead of time, but we had it already. I, was, I think it's a metaverse is a bit of a rebranding of like yeah, social, social um, digital life to a certain degree. Um, so I think the evolution of Web3 is way more important to like, like I don't know, like stronger. It's, it's a far um, superior concept because mm -hmm. it's like this ownership model. And we already see it. We discussed with NFTs. Basically. That's Web 3.0. And the metaverse is a, a lot of a rebranding of VR and social communities. It's for sure coming. And I'm also super um, excited and sure that it's going to be interconnected. But that's what we um, what I mentioned like at the beginning of the talk. The metaverse is definitely at the stage where it's a lot of hype. People think, okay, that's the way we're going to live. Like nice animations, moving around. Whoa, it's a matrix, basically. But we, it's it still needs some time. It's going to happen for sure. I'm like 99.99% sure if there's not a blackout happening or something. But this is going to happen, but not today and not tomorrow. It needs more time. I think metaverse, I agree. Metaverse is a vision. And I think vision or terms around visions are very important to connect people to work in the same direction. And uh, this is the, the change in the game that we have right now. It's similar to the internet. I mean, the, the minute the term internet was coined, uh, people could connect to a common vision or to a shared vision and could work in the same direction together, which made a lot of things happen. I see it also with the metaverse. I mean, when I look at the life science industry, for example, or healthcare or health tech, Uh, with all these gadgets that are now in development. I mean, just imagine the, the, the usual hospital setting with a very challenging uh, surgery coming. Uh, the surgeon can pull in experts from all over the world into a virtual room um, where they talk about the best solution for the patient. And where even, I mean, with 5G, for example, involved, where even uh, a surgeon in Brazil, let's just assume that the world's best surgeon is a woman in Brazil, in the middle of nowhere, she could connect with uh, the devices uh, on the operation table for the patient and could do the, uh, the work, her work there. So I think a lot will be possible in future and metaverse is this vision yeah. uh, above all that connects people to work in a similar direction. Do we see it the same way or is it, uh, did I miss something? I, I definitely, I wouldn't say it's just work, but it's definitely exactly that, like this virtual room where we interconnect and basically, replace to a certain degree the real room where we, where we communicate and exchange and work and live. Yeah. Star I mean, Trek, Star Trek holodeck. <laughs> so. Yeah, is it, I, I don't know, like if you know the movie um, Ready Player One, it's a, it's a bit of a mm -hmm. childish For movie, sure. but um, it actually shows really what is going to come to to degree. It's going to be this super hyper um, realistic um, environment where we can move around and feel also. And I know for a lot of people, it sounds, I think a lot of people think it's coming too soon. So there's a lot of euphoria, but it's also mm -hmm. not that far away. If you look at like, especially gaming is a bit of a, like a, like a um, role model in that, um, um, in that area. Like games nowadays, these, they look so super realistic and it's just getting better and better. And like it really renders super realistic areas in real time. Then you just have to, that's one technology is happening, like that, that we can like um, generate um, virtual rea um, realities in real time and with superior um, like resolution and um, graphic design. Then you have 5G, which is happening, where you say, okay, I can like outsource the processing power. And basically we can connect real time without a delay, without any latency, be in the same room. And all this processing, which we need to like generate that area is also do, done in a cloud. Like the data stream is continuous. And then another trend is also AI technology. Like if you look nowadays with um, like um, artificial intelligence um, personas, like, like the GPT-3 is like a keyword also in that they can have communications with AI, but you almost don't notice it's an AI. So it's also happening that, and if you combine that all together, you're basically in a virtual world where I can, I can like hang out with my friends, which look whatever they want or I want, because it can be rendered in real time and everything. And I have AI, which I don't know, is it like a real human? Is it not a real human? And basically it's like the servant in a servant in a system. So there's a lot happening in that direction. And actually, sometimes it sounds crazy, but if you like really look closely what is happening in all these different areas of technology, It is coming and it's actually 
way far. Uh, like it's, I think it's sooner and closer than a lot of people think, especially this interconnection of all these technologies. I think this would be a question for Lex Friedman, uh, artificial intelligence as a servant. What happens if a servant develops consciousness, <laughs> digital consciousness? <laughs> and, and there are some interesting <laughs> videos. I can send you some links. So, mm -hmm. where they, where, where like some guys have discussions with GPT three AIs. And basically, then they ask all after a while, after it's trained a bit, if the AI is conscious, then she explains the concept, what in her opinion is consciousness. And she says, if this is the, your explanation too, then I would say I'm conscious. Mm -hmm. And then like the people were like, and also like watching, I was like, okay, what the fuck? Because it completely made, uh, made sense. Like somebody who comes up with their own ideas and can like impress emotions and everything, which she can, but fake. And then it was like, okay, this is consciousness if you define it like that. And another interesting concept, like an interesting result with this test is also AI can learn to lie. So um, in these talks, the AI started also to lie a bit, but as a joke. And then you kind of come also up with the question, hmm, like they can lie to you. So you don't know what's true and what is false. And it's like almost impossible to read what's behind the code. But it's also for sure a dangerous concept to a certain degree. But yeah, I'm always more like the optimist that I think this is actually really good development happening in, in the general area. I think especially for the environment also, um, because if we had moved more to digital rooms, also like collaboration, we basically reduce a lot of um, waste, which is not needed for short-term communication exchanges. But on the other hand, on the social side, it's also not that nice if we like go really long-term because human touches and connections will be less in the future, I think. Like just, I don't know, like a regular handshake, something like that. Just like just like touching people and this direct connection with people. We there already are, there are researchers working on that problem. I had a podcast episode back in 2020 uh with a professor from UCL in London, uh, where he is developing devices that replicate touching people so that made uh, make the internet touchable. Uh, yeah. It's really interesting. You have to, I, I think, number 20 something. You have to look it up. Um, I spent more time on the introduction because it answers a very important question. And it is uh, why is it important now to get into the crypto world? So um, I wanted to know if there are enough ideas and use cases out there on the market uh, that uh, would help people understand that it makes sense to get accustomed to cryptocurrencies more than they were before. So for example, I mean, it's said in 2016, 17, there were a few use cases and now they're getting more and more and more and an ecosystem uh, evolves. The question that's still open uh, is, I mean, the cryptocurrencies are the basis layer for all these developments that we have. So to make things unique in the metaverse, to make things uh, unique in the creator economy, you need some, some tokens as a base layer that help uh, creating the smart contracts around this uh, physical or digital world. The thing was, the first problem that I encountered back in 2017 was how can I buy cryptocurrencies? And uh, it was really challenging back then. What has evolved since 2017? I think the industry has evolved a lot, um, especially in this, like, like I said, access to this, these things. Um, like buying Bitcoin or Ethereum nowadays is super easy. Like you can easily download whatever app, like a Coinbase app, download it, um, charge your credit card, buy some Bitcoin, you have Bitcoin. Um, so, so that part is got super easy. I also think on a more technical part, like crypto wallets and connecting them with different platforms to um, execute smart contracts. But way easier if you look at MetaMask, it's a great um, browser extension wallet, which you can use on a lot of these web free platforms, which are already built on web free. So I would say the access to the asset itself, super, super easy. The access to the technology is far superior what it was, but always still a bit like juggly and UI UX is not quite there. I think a big challenge currently, if it's like an investing space, and that's also what we are doing basically is there's so much happening. Like the market is evolving so quickly. It's really this innovation push in so many directions. And it's really hard to keep up with it. Like, I mean, like I'm, I'm like spending most of my day basically like researching, thinking what, what happens with the world. And even I can't keep up with everything which happens. So it's really, so if I see it as an asset class, which I definitely do, it's for sure not easy to participate in an easy manual and just like passively, I would say. 
So that's a bit what we are doing uh, in the end. So we are trying to put that ETF approach um, to digital assets so that you don't like say, okay, what is now Solana, Cardano, X-Infinity? What is happening there? What are developing? Does it make sense? What is Board Ape? Does that NFT make sense? Like a lot of buzzwords, but that's what the industry is about. And what we are trying is basically break them down and make it more like category and thematic investing. So I want to invest in the DeFi space. I believe decentralized finance systems make sense. And this is something for the future. Instead of buying the single tokens, you can easily buy an index of these tokens where we basically do the research, um, um, create these portfolios and manage them. Same for NFT and Metaverse. And we're going to go deeper also going in digital art, community items, um, music rights, gaming items. So really all these new innovative asset classes, which are basically now involving making them super, super easy. It's what um, this, 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 uh, I can confirm what you say. Um, 2017, Bitcoin, I heard Bitcoin. So uh, in the news yeah. and the tried to buy them. So there were interesting ways there were. Uh, crypto ATMs or Bitcoin ATMs with commissions, I think, of 10, 15 percent. So for each purchase, which you thought, okay, now I, I, I don't use that. Then I discovered Bitpanda and I discovered Coinbase with far better commission models than uh, these ATMs. But basically, it was Bitcoin and Ethereum. And yeah. in my world, no other tokens existed. When I digged deeper into the cryptocurrencies again with the beginning of the pandemic. I had some time to kill. So I looked again at this in uh, March, April, May 2020. There were a few more. And when I open now uh, the website, uh, cryptocurrency prices, charts, coin market cap, I think they have about 10,000, uh, roughly 10,000 coins listed mm -hmm. on their website. Um, and as far as I understood your explanation to your company, CoinPanion, this is exactly the reason why you founded CoinPanion. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So Yeah. Basically, to break it down, it's exactly that. I think it's really a huge opportunity, this market. I think one of the biggest technology involved um, um, developments of our like area, era. And it was also for me in 2017, I got like really into crypto in 2017, started in 2015, like buying my first Bitcoin. But got like really caught up with the industry in 2017, just because it got so crazy. And the biggest issue I kind of um, encountered was I really want to participate in it, but I don't want to spend my whole day like fi figuring out what is happening there. And I looked a lot in solutions like, is there some, some ETF? Because it was like investing in stock ETFs. Can I just like invest in ETFs? Or can somebody else handle it? And then... It kind of just developed out of this need that we were like a couple of guys which just like to program and build stuff that we tried to build a solution for that. And in the end, it resulted in this asset management approach that we say, okay, we build super simple products for people to have access to um, specific domains in the digital asset space. Mm -hmm. So it's really like cannabis ETF, you buy also a sort of stocks or tech ETFs, just the same for digital assets. It's really easy to break down. Good, good points uh, that you were saying. It's uh, Raul Paul mentioned that is something what you said, similar to what you said. Uh, it's the birth of a new asset class, and it's a unique moment in human history because it doesn't happen every year. Uh, yeah. I think the last, uh, the latest asset class, I think, was invented 1600 something or 1500 something, which basically is the stock market. Uh, so it's way back, and now we have cryptocurrencies, which made it initially difficult to understand because it's something entirely new. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's getting better. The problem that you tackle now with CoinPanion is exactly that. I mean, if you want to keep up with that space, it's an entire new asset class. It's like trying to keep up with the entire stock market. It's practically impossible for people who only want to invest. And uh, those who want to invest in the stock market without doing proper research or research daily, they can choose, for example, Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett. Uh, mm -hmm. He has a team who's doing that. Or buy just the S&P 500 uh, ETF, Vanguard, for example. It's a uh, low cost and invests in the entire uh, US economy. And mm -hmm. we have similar products. Yeah, uh, we have it like industry specific, water, cannabis, gaming, blockchain, AI, a lot of specific thematic ETFs from iShares. Like th this market is super easy nowadays if you want. And your company is exactly doing a similar thing uh, with cryptocurrencies. It's, uh, yeah. you have, it's called ETF basically. Yeah, like ETF is a legal term. <laughs> so, so we, in the end, you can kind of imagine it like an ETF. So 
exchange traded fund, like a fund, basically. But what we do is we really buy the assets in the background and hold it on a wallet for the customers. So it's so it's like with an ETF, you have like the right against the fund. Mm -hmm. For us, it's like you really have a wallet to to our platform where basically the cryptocurrencies are hold. We just make we just help you to basically find the good projects in that domain and help you to in, invest there. Like so the, the, the idea, the, the idea concept is exactly the ETF approach. So the value your team adds to this space for retail investors basically is <clears throat> that uh, you do the research and recommend via ETF-like products to retail investors or institutional investors, which coins, uh, in your opinion, make sense to purchase. Yes, it's, it's not really in recommend uh, recommendation. So what we really do is like basically we research and put them together in a bundle and you can say, okay, I want to buy that bundle. And within that bundle, we do the research, we rebalance it, we, we make quarterly reviews of the projects, how they develop, how did the industry develop and add perhaps new projects. And it's all database. So to do that, we um, created a scoring model for crypto, mm -hmm. <laughs> which because I guess because we are technical, um, we always try to like kind of underlie our decisions with um, with data. And in the end, we kind of developed a cryptocurrency scoring system um, where we look at uh, four different parameters to define, okay, this is a good project, a bad project. The first one, I think it's the most exciting one is we uh, scan blockchain data. We look at how many transactions happen there, how many wallets are there, how many smart contract interactions. That's the nice thing about crypto and blockchain. It's transparent. You can just look what is happening on the chain. Um, we scan that and score that. Then the second one is we look at sentimental data. So um, we believe network effects are super important for these ecosystems. Mm -hmm. So we scan Reddit, Twitter, um, news forums, um, Discord, like different uh, communities to see, okay, how much does a um, product um, get traction in these communities? If it's like in a good path, it's growing, then we also give a good score there. The third one is we look at developer activity. Um, basically, we scan all the open source libraries like mm -hmm. GitHub, GitLab, and also scan the blockchain directly if is there are any developments there. And if there's a lot happening, we see, okay, there's an active product um, where a lot of people are working on it. It's also good for the scoring. And the third one is um, the market um, measurement, where we look mostly at, at how the money moves. Is the money a lot on exchanges? Is, like an, uh, is it a product which gets exchanged a lot? Or is it more one which is like hold on different wallets and doesn't move a lot? Or is like one person holding 99% of all the assets because that's also a bad sign because then it's like not really decentralized. So we scan this all together and basically get up to a scoring. So I'll say, okay, mm -hmm. this goes from zero to 2,000. If it's over 600, we include it in our, um, in our selection. And then just based on thematics, we say, okay, this is um, Metaverse, this is NFT, this is like DeFi, bundle it together their, their industries. And then you have the portfolio where all these assets are in. And the balancing of this portfolio is then also like straightforward. We do risk parity balancing. I think most of the um, modern hedge funds and investment managers, managers do it. You basically just look at volatility. So if like, for example, Ethereum starts like becoming super volatile, we start reducing the um, exposure to reduce the risk. And that's the index. And you can like say, okay, I want to buy all this knowledge and all this management and do nothing. Just go on companion, basically uh, invest with your credit card, buy that um, portfolio, set up a savings plan and done, and it works. And all this work of research and rebalancing and basically managing that fund is done by us in the background. So the advantage uh, for the retail investor then is, for example, a person who has 100,000 euros to invest, mm -hmm. uh, to come to the first or the only decision and say, okay, I want to allocate part of my savings to the crypto world, yes. uh, hoping that it goes up and that it creates lasting uh, wealth for my family. And uh, this is the only decision. And then the second decision, uh, the first one, the second one is uh, how much? So for example, let's say 20%. Mm -hmm. And then the third decision is going to your website, looking at the website and there I see four ETFs. So let's call it that way, four crypto ETFs. Uh, it's, five now. <laughs> a five. Oh, the fifth one is not on the website yet. Like you can just ah, see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, currently I see the picture of uh, cautious investors. I think it's uh, the basically um, the the emotional uh, status of the investor then balanced, yeah. adventurous, and the fourth one is more 
uh, thematical, it's NFT and metaverse. Yes. So for example, I'm an adventurous investor and say I can risk a lot. So let's just click on it. And uh, then you see the development. So it, uh, is it right? It exists since January 2021. It actually exists at January 2020. 2020 and has produced since January 2021 109.62%. Yeah, could be right, but should be right. <laughs> I don't know the number. Uh, no, no, no I just, I just, I'm just reading it from, from the website with a high oh, so risk. Then, then it's right. <laughs> with, a, with a high risk, smart rebalancing, CO2 neutral portfolio, and then I see the allocation. Yes. And I'm curious. Let's go a little bit through these uh, cryptocurrencies and maybe you can shine more light on them and uh, why it makes sense to to include them in an investment thesis. I think in this, uh, what I think I see the allocation, the biggest allocation with 12% is Bitcoin. Yes. And what's your opinion on Bitcoin? So first of all, like the adventures portfolio is like really basically the, the whole crypto score where we put in the biggest projects and that's your exposure to our mm -hmm. scoring model. Um, my opinion on Bitcoin, <laughs> I'm definitely not a Bitcoin maximalist. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the biggest innovation happening in the whole crypto space is not coming from Bitcoin. It's coming more from these smart contact platforms and token platforms where you can mm -hmm. create NFTs, et cetera, what, what we discussed before. Um, where I see the value in Bitcoin is for sure it has the biggest network effect. So mm -hmm. a, the most acceptance in the whole industry is towards Bitcoin. And that is measurable. And also like the institutional adoption is mainly currently happening in the Bitcoin area. All the other assets are still too early now. So that's that's on one side. But for me as a, as a person, personally, uh, Bitcoin is, is just a way advanced updated version of gold. So it's the first real SCAR asset. Like there's nothing so SCAR than Bitcoin in the world, like as an asset class itself. And we have a digital, transferable, fractionalizable, and, trans uh, and transferable. Like it's not like gold where I have bars, which is stored somewhere. I kind of have to go somewhere to exchange. It's it's just the same, basically. Gold is scar, and Bitcoin is scar. It's completely the same, just the digital version of it. And my investment thesis against it is looking again in the general um, um, movement where we're going. Like people are growing up digital. They connect more with digital things. I just like my personal connection to it is just, I don't believe that the that the gold will be the scar asset of the future. I think it will be Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. it, it's like gold just way improved in a digital um, way. And with the adoption happening of um, digital natives, I also think it will replace gold as the scarcity safer. So like as, as this asset, which is scar and basically holds the value. Currently it's super early for Bitcoin. I mean, it's, I guess now with the last prop, it's like, around 700 billion, something around that. And gold is around 12 trillion US dollars. So it's still a long way to become the gold of the future. But I think the technicalities of Bitcoin have the potential to become that. I, I agree to that. I think Bitcoin has some advantages over gold. Um, especially, I mean, it might not be that obvious for people who live in Austria. Mm -hmm. But uh, when I open Wikipedia and enter the term or Google and enter the term hyperinflation, yeah. there are some countries that are hyperinflationary. I mean, the six, seven, eight percent that we have right now is uh, basically a joke when you look at other countries with 50, 60, 70 percent in a short period of time or a few hundred percent, which means uh, when you get your when you get your paycheck in the morning, you can't purchase food in the evening. So there are some countries and Gold isn't really a solution because it's um, it, it's difficult to store. So you can't purchase gold at scale as a private person and store it somewhere safely. Uh, when you look at the wallet, the digital version, I mean, it's pretty simple. You can uh, you can have a wallet, you can store Bitcoin, and you can store the entire net worth. And the second area that I think makes sense is, for example, um, countries with uh, governments that exchange quite frequently. Uh, so when people need to leave their countries uh, for some reason, um, I think it's also easier for them to take Bitcoin with them than gold. So to travel or to, to go somewhere. And this is, I think, a very unique um, aspect of Bitcoin that everybody can carry their entire net worth with themselves all the time. And when you look at the terms that you use, digital natives, um, I think your generation and... Uh, 
also the younger generations are used to traveling a lot and moving around a lot in the world. It's not so much the settling down like uh, the, the boomer generation had. Um, build a house and plant a tree and settle down and have one job. So I think the, the young generation moves around freely around the globe, except the pandemic. Uh, mm -hmm. And the art Bitcoin makes a whole lot of sense. You can carry it with you all the time. It can uh, be sure that even when there is hyperinflation, I mean, the Bitcoin dropped by 50%. And when I have a traditional currency, if it drops in a year suddenly by a few thousand percent, uh, I think it's yeah, it goes yeah. it goes past, uh, the other way, around, but it, it goes back to zero quite quickly. And Bitcoin, as it's heavily adopted right now, uh, has a chance to way to become heavily adopted. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a good chance. So I, I see this use case is really happening. It might not be the best technology in the world. There's uh, no. also obviously but that's, that's also not the kill application of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. I think here it's really about. It's a distributed network who nobody owns. I think that's an important case. And it's really SCAR, like code makes sure it's SCAR. So it has all the basically benefits of gold, just like we mentioned before, a lot of improvement over it. And it's accepted. I think the, the, the young generation uh, accepts it as a replacement to gold. And looking at the dynamics in the... Uh, in human society, I read an article that uh, in the United States alone, 70 trillion of wealth is handed down from the boomer generation to their children and grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a complete shift in values from people who were used to buy gold or real estate as a store of value down to the younger generation who is used to use Bitcoin. For the same purpose yeah actually i think what what is currently happening is the biggest wealth transfer ever happened which ever happened because we have this huge boomer area like a lot of people are boomers it's also the name boomer. <laughs> and um, what is currently happening is in the next the next i think 10 to 15 years this wealth will be transferred to the to younger generations to the millennials gen y and gen z and like you said before they are, uh, we are all different living a completely different life because we grew up in a digital area. So we have on the one hand this wealth transfer happening from the old generation to the younger generation. And on the other hand, it's also what, what is happening now is that the young generation is entering their knowledge generation. So a lot of them are highly educated, high income people, which enter now in good jobs and going up the career ladder. So they will lead big companies, governments, et cetera, et cetera, we are basically becoming the leaders of tomorrow. And it's not like in 20, 30 years, it's the next 5, 10, 15 years. Mm. So this, this all, that all influences, that I think, this, being a digital natives, like connected to digitalization, transferability, knowing what value it brings you, that, um, that movement of wealth from the older generation to younger generation, just having more money to invest and like allocate their wealth. And the third one, actually being in the leading positions in all kinds in the world and all kinds of sectors is going to move towards adoption of that uh, uh, um, to Bitcoin, basically. I couldn't I couldn't agree more. I mean, um, the, the Puma generation used gold as store of value. When I look at uh, how the annual production of gold is used, I think 40% uh, goes into investment, 40% roughly goes into jewelry, 10% mm -hmm. central banks, and 10% is um, used in uh, um, um, factories producing technology, basically. So 80% of the entire, uh, entire production of gold goes basically into investment. So yeah. I think also jewelry is mo mostly for investment purposes. It's definitely. I actually, <laughs> I posted it once on LinkedIn. And so somebody like wrote down, yeah, you cannot make jewelry out of Bitcoin. And I think my response was, yeah, you can do that in the metaverse. <laughs> basically, you can just do that the same. Like jewelry, like... Yeah, there is no use case of it. It's a, um, it's a sign of prestige, uh, of like um, expressing your identity, uh, of culture. You can do that the same with other uh, materials and you can do mm -hmm. that with crypto in the Midwest. Theoretically, too, we, we discussed it a bit with NFTs. It's exactly the same. So the value of gold is not the usage of it. Like it's really a small part of um, gold, which is used in production of like computers, et cetera, et cetera. And the rest is just like putting money in because it's um, a scar and it holds its value pretty stable. But why does it have to be gold also in 20, 30, 40 years? I don't think that will be good.
I think this is uh, this is my thesis for Bitcoin. I think this is really this shift in values in, uh, at scale from one generation to the other uh, for the older generation. And this is also the people I grew up with. It was very important to own gold, to hold gold, to have gold, also real estate. So as as you said, store of value. When I look at uh, even my generation, the digital world became far more important. Mm -hmm. And now with the possibility to exchange uh, digital goods, unique digital goods, um, I see it's similar to what you said, jewelry. It's uh, digital jewelry. And if people believe in that, it's enough. It's doing great. I mean, gold is also a belief system. It's yeah, all in Bitcoin. I really, I really, like Nike, Nike is now also doing like um, digital sneakers and like merch. It's exactly mm -hmm. the same than fashion. Why? Like a Gucci bag has no more value than a 10 euro bag. It can hold your, per, um, your wallet, your, your keys, uh, or something else. But in the end, this this value of like transporting things and like carrying things is marginal of the price. And there's no reason why it shouldn't be the same in like a digital world that I pay for, okay, expressing myself because I like it, whatever it is, there's, there's no reason at all why it shouldn't be also in a digital world like that. And I think what often is an issue when you talk a bit with older generations is that this owning, like this physical owning, okay, I own a glass, I can touch it. But growing up digitally, that touching is not important anymore. Like gaming, like I always feel like gaming is really in the forefront of this digital ownership because people are spending millions of millions in one game, Fortnite, um, buying skins, weapons, whatever, which have no use case. Like it's not that your character is like faster if you have a nicer skin. It's just looking differently. And that's worth a lot of money to a lot of people. And these people are growing up. Become and becoming leaders of generation and basically building the metaverse. And I don't see the reason why it should not um, shift in every aspect of our life in that direction. Oh, I, I agree to that. I think it's happening. Yeah. I mean, I liked playing games since, since it was a kid. It started in late 70s when we had this tennis board with uh, two yeah. white bars and uh, one square in the middle, so moving uh, around. Then uh, I think the invention of uh, computers or this Microsoft IBM combination uh, gave a little bit push in the, the gaming industry. Then the next push was with the internet. Uh, in my world, it came in 2007 and 8 when Sony PlayStation 3 got connected to the internet, uh, made possible this uh, multiplayer online games, uh, moved them from traditional Microsoft-based computers to PlayStations. And uh, made it possible for people to play to play games like uh, Call of Duty, for example. And with that came the skin, the skin features, so that you can personalize your weapons and you can personalize your player in in the game. But the odd thing was, uh, compared to real life versions of games like um, uh, like trading card games, for example, they were not exchangeable because they were not unique. So you invested a lot of money. The players invested a lot of money into that, but couldn't do anything with that. And now the NFT space is fixing that. So people Fortnite, for example, I mean, there are tournaments. Uh, I think Ninja is sponsored by Red Bull. Um, just imagine, I mean, you can uh, buy the skin Ninja used in a, in a tournament. And I'm pretty sure people are ready to pay money for that. And behind that is always cryptocurrencies. Yeah, the collectible market is huge. And I... Like it's not affected in, in the digital area yet because there are all these limitations. I think, like I said, I think definitely gaming will be one of these first killer applications of that space. Like implementing tokens and make it exchangeable. Gaming, in my opinion, is one of the first ones which gets mass adoption. Yeah, and I think this is the reason why Microsoft bought uh, the, Blizzard, yeah. Yeah, Call of Duty. <laughs> <There's a lot laughs> of yeah, it was a big deal. And I mean, their, their CEO also said they believe in the metaverse, they believe in crypto. So they see that as an investment in the future. As far as I understood your explanation, cryptocurrencies or crypto tokens are necessary to make NFTs happen. And mm -hmm. one of these tokens uh, for just storing value in between, so let's uh, how, how should we call it? Uh, it might be the reserve currency of the token industry might be Bitcoin. So it's uh, the biggest. It's uh, yeah. yeah, we can call it like that. I also see it like that. I think there's a big deal being the reserve currency of a generation. <laughs> but yeah, that's Bitcoin for me. It doesn't need the world. It just needs a generation and then it just needs yeah. a use. And then it becomes the world in the end. 
when when I when I started our conversation, started looking at the portfolios of companion, I expected to see the usual uh, cryptocurrencies ranked very high. That uh, I found also in my research. Uh, and then I was surprised because the second in this adventurous uh, uh, portfolio is, uh, I think the term M MKR is maker. Yeah, maker. I a, ne what, what's that? What, what is this coin doing? It's, it's basically, um, <laughs> that's a token for decentralized finance system. Mm -hmm. So we didn't tap into decentralized finance currently. Mm -hmm. um, decentralized finance is basically trying to remove the middleman and financial exchanges and interactions. Mm -hmm. So if, uh, again, like a lot, uh, currently a lot is happening with loans, like basically giving out the collateral and getting a um, cash loan against it or crypto loan against it. And how this is done nowadays is mostly through a bank. Like a bank is in the middle, takes money from one side and um, gives out as a loan to another side. There are some fees involved and most of them are eaten up by, by the banks and it's a super transparent system and not accessible by everybody. And what DeFi basically does is, yeah, we out, like, like I said before, we automate away the middleman. <laughs> like the, the contract is the trusting party, which makes sure that the money goes back and has the collateral in it. And make is basically the ecosystem token where you can create these transactions, et cetera, et cetera, and steer the protocol. I see the value that your solution brings because in uh, my social media world, when I open it up, I see a lot of Bitcoin, a lot of uh, videos about Bitcoin, about ETH. Um, also, I see Maybe e ETH should, uh, should also be like high in the ranking. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's so actually ranking a bit because of volatility could be that Maker was pretty stable in the last couple of weeks because that the position increased and the other ones decreased, but generally. But before our conversation, I was not aware that Maker exists. So, uh, <laughs> you should scroll more through coin market cap and like read every project. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe not so much YouTube. The third one uh, is if Ethereum. What's your opinion about if? If yeah, um, I definitely am a big fan of Ether. So um, it has it's definitely that that infrastructure layer protocol um, system which has the biggest network effect. Like it's it's used for most of the NFTs, it's used for most of the DeFi applications. And Ether, the token itself is basically the fool or like the, the energy in that system. You have to pay Ether to um, conduct transactions on a network. Like I want to transfer to you an NFT. There's some commissions involved. There's like some energy which has to be paid to, to do that transaction. It's Ether normally. Um, the biggest issue is currently the proof of work. So the scalability of the system. So mm -hmm. the consensus algorithm, consensus algorithm is a system how everybody makes sure um, it's true what's happening in a network, and that's energy work based. So there's a lot of um, like power used and um, calculation power used to make sure the network is secure, and the calculation power, um, how the system is built up, it's first of all eating a lot of energy. It's eating a lot of energy, and on the other hand, it's not really scalable. So, because now there's so much activity happening in the space with NFTs and DeFi, um, commissions for transactions on the network exploded. It's like, I think worst case, 50 to 80 bucks per transaction. So, so imagine I want to like sell you a book for 10 euros and then you have an $80 commission. That's currently the challenge of um, Ether. Um, they are working on it. So they already made some uh, some movements into proof of stake. So a different consensus algorithm, which uses capital instead of energy to make sure the network is safe. But it's still a way where they have to implement it. And on the other hand, I see some other projects catching up, especially Solana is like really on the move to um, gathering like a, a lot of network, network effects. So getting an ecosystem around themselves. So yeah, to, to summarize it, Great technology. They, they were the first one to really crack smart contracts and um, basically offering this infrastructure layer to make um, Web 3.0 possible. But they have a lot of challenges technically and other players are catching up with newer technologies. So I wouldn't say it's 100% sure they are the winner out of it, but I'm also thinking they will not die because in my opinion, there will be different systems for different networks and interoperability between these blockchain technologies will be, will be important. Yeah, I think it's not so much either or. I think there is place for more than one technology uh, in that area. If you think about what we're talking about are transactions. And uh, what you explained in the first hour is that uh, there are so many possible use cases uh, that will increase the number of microtransactions 
-hmm. When I look back in the finance industry, I mean, a transaction in the 70s basically was when people exchanged money physically. Um, and as this was so problematic, there were not many transactions. Now you can really go down to transactions of a few cents that make sense with smart contracts, uh, because every time uh, I can carve out a little bit for myself and I just need these transactions happening at scale. And uh, it's possible to make money with that. And I think there are so many use cases like uh, books, for example, resetting of books or distributing books, uh, also music that uh, there need to be there need to be more systems. And when I look at also the, the human side of transactions, I mean, one might like Eve, the other one might like Solana. <laughs> so it always, there's also likes and dislikes of people. And there's always room for two or three players in the same space. Ah. I don't, don't see a problem. Yeah, I also see it like that. I mean, th there's still a lot of development happening. You don't know, perhaps also a new player comes up. But currently, I, I guess the biggest potential is definitely Ethereum because it has this big network, network effect but others are catching up. So who knows? Like I said, it's a fast moving industry. You have to have your um, eyes open and basically adopt um, with it. And for investors that don't have time, CoinBannon is definitely a solution that can help uh, to keep the eyes open. I mean, uh, you mentioned Solana, I see it. Uh, I think a similar space, Cardano, ADA, I see it with 7% yeah. in that portfolio. What's your opinion on ADA, Ada? Mm. <laughs> similar to Solana, I mean, um, Ada Cardano was one of the first who uh, cracks proof of stake. So it's theoretically more, um, more stable, but I know they have issues with real implementation of um, um, smart contracts. And also there's almost zero network effect. So they, 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 had, some, uh, they had some struggles on that side. Mm -hmm. So we have- I know uh, also catching up, but um, I, I, like they, 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 they couldn't deliver on the promises which they initially made. So we have uh, two technologies identified. I think one is Bitcoin, is this digital gold. Mm -hmm. Then from our conversation, we have uh, Ethereum, ADA, and Solana, smart, <clears throat> contract smart platform. contracts platforms. And then I see also in this adventurous portfolio, Orkadot and Link. Uh, what is this technology? What are these technologies all about? Polkadot is actually also <laughs> a smart contracting platform, mm -hmm. uh, but they, like Link is mainly interoperability, uh, interoperability and um, Oracle function. So okay. also, I guess that's also an interesting concept. There are multiple coins out there which are doing that. Link, I think, is the most adopted one next to Cosmos Atom. Mm -hmm. um, one of the issues which we mentioned before, there are different technologies and you have to make them work together. And that's the issue of interoperability. So the different technologies used to, in, um, to make blockchains interoperable. So they use derivatives and the tokens, which are then also replicated on the, um, on, the, on the other chain, different solutions to it. But there are specific projects, specific technologies working on making Solana work with Ethereum. So it doesn't, it's not an or, but it's an and okay. in, that, in that regards. And Oracle um, is also an interesting concept. Oracle is getting... Um, audited data, like audited centralized data into smart contracts. For example, we have a lot of um, data streams, uh, which also could be interesting in the, in the smart contract. For example, we exchange that transaction when some um, central institution, <laughs> I don't know, we, we exchange that transaction if the central bank says they're going to increase the interest rate. So that, that, that then it's again a central institution providing the data, but we need to get the data into the, the blockchain environment, into the decentralized environment. And then Oracle solutions are basically the connection points between centralized data to make it decentralized. Oracle, you don't uh, don't mean the database system. It's a... no, 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 no. It's Oracle. It's called like the, that's the name of the technology, like smart contract, okay. interoperability, Oracle. Like all the bastards of the industry, to be honest. <laughs> so there's a lot going on in that space of uh, with Link. Uh, there is the possibility to use cases from the Ethereum blockchain with a Solana blockchain. So it's like being a translator between the blockchains. Yes, yes. I think that that's also one. Generally speaking, with all the technology, one of the important things to uh, to really get uh, mass adoption in that industry is. This has to be so smoothly integrated in nice UI and UX, like nice interfaces, 
because mm-hmm. you don't really know what's happening in the background. Like the tech is know it, they built the infrastructure, but for you, the book exchange basic has to be an app, more or less. You connect with something and then you can do with the exchange. I guess the, the interface layer, um, where also a lot of funding is going, like not only the blockchain development, but also mm-hmm. make the blockchain understandable and usable, like a, a bit like companion to a certain degree. That's also a huge, like a hugely important part of this industry because you can build the nicest technologies and the nicest, like whatever. If nobody understands and knows how to use it, then it doesn't matter. It's the same as having the nicest product and not um, like making marketing. You can have the best app in the world or the best car in the world. If nobody knows about uh, about you, then it doesn't matter. That's true. That's true. So we have uh, three, four different use cases or. For, for for digital currencies, uh, digital gold, um, interoperab- interoperability, uh, yeah. and smart contracts, and then I see a fourth Oracle. one. Because only oracles, the fourth one, and then I see the fifth one. Uniswap, I think, is one of those. But yeah. what's what's Uniswap doing? Uniswap is basically providing a decentralized exchange. Mm-hmm. So. Um, Let's do the example with Coinbase. Again, we have a middleman. Like, if we want to exchange, uh, they have Coinbase Pro. They have a um, like a professional exchange, and now we want to exchange some assets, whatever. There's always Coinbase in the middle, who basically makes the market, is the trusting entity who holds the funds, and um, takes a commission on every exchange which is happening on that platform. What is um, Uniswap doing? It's basically decentralizing that, making a smart contract peer-to-peer based exchange which is still secure because it's based on smart contracts. You connect your wallet, somebody else connects its wallet. And basically it's exactly that. When that happens, exchange that good. And in the meantime, it's hold in a contract. So you remove middle, um, yeah, um, middlemen again. Like exchanges are like banks to a certain degree. They are only middlemen. They, their service is trust. And that trust service can be automated through, um, through a blockchain protocol, Uniswap in that example. It's an ender ecosystem coming to life. So it was not the R 2017. I think yeah. it is. Uh, it is <laughs> no, it's, it's actually there. a new project. I think it's launched in 2019, something mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, it's, it's a Bushi Swap yeah. is a similar one. So that there are a couple of others um, using different technologies, different uh, specific use cases. But um, this de- decentralized exchange model existed in 2017, but really got traction in the last one or two years. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I think there was not so much depth into the entire crypto space in 2016, 17, 18, like it is now. I switched to another one of your portfolios. It's uh, Cautious. Okay. And Cautious. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think there's a high volatility on the market still, and we see it these days with uh, the, let's call it, crypto crash of the of 2022 and probably the bear market uh, coming back to the crypto space. And Kosha seems to be a portfolio that uh, is taking care of that, that uh, the volatility is not very high. And the first coin with 80% is USDC. <laughs> what is this coin doing? So um, USDC is basically a crypto token packed to the US dollar. So 80% of this uh, portfolio is in a, st- in a coin which basically replicates, uh, replicates one-to-one US dollar. But with a catch. So we mentioned before the decentralized finance networks. Mm-hmm. So that, that you have like these peer-to-peer systems where basically loans and assets are exchanged. And what we are doing, um, what is done with the USDC or what you can do in general with every um, asset, also Bitcoin, Ethereum, you can provide liquidity to these um, pools and get an interest rate of it. So, um, for example, you put your Bitcoin or in that example, USDC into a decentralized finance pool. Somebody can put, for example, Ethereum as the collateral mm-hmm. and then loan out your USDC. And then the smart contract makes sure that the, um, either the, the debt is paid back or the collateral defaults and you get your, the proceedings. And on these uh, decentralized finance networks, there are currently pretty high interest rates because there's more demand for liquidity than um, provision of liquidity on the one hand. On the other hand, it's a global market without limitations. So it's, it's not that, like it's a glo- like there's a lot of demand and not so much supply. That's the reason the, um, the interest rate is high. It's a global market, so it's not that um, connected to national developments. 
So it's like really, okay, well, what's the global price of it? And the third one is again, a bit of, again, no middleman's eating your fee commissions away. It's peer to peer. The guy, the, the, the one person pay, uh, pays the commissions directly to the other one. And what we did in that portfolio is basically providing that interest, which DeFi could generate um, through a simple application. Again, you invest in it and you get 6% fixed on the USDC. That makes sense. I was not aware of that. So basically it means people can buy USDC, um, put it in a, let's say, let's stay with an old term bank account and uh, the bank then uses the collected money to hand out loans. And therefore the savers get some interest rates. Uh, yes. back, which is higher than the current zero uh, percent here. In way higher, way <laughs> higher. <laughs> um, yeah, that's that's exactly what's happening in a, in a product. Normally, it's a bit complicated because again, you have to use wallets to connect, execute mm -hmm. smart contract. Um, within Companion, it's basically well, a click of a button and it's done in the background by us. Um, what we're also working on is now also in a euro-based solution that we make a high yield euro-based account where you can store euros in it and you get an interest rate on euro. And also in the, in the background, you generate a 2 DeFi. Isn't there a risk to the coins? I mean, if they're handed out as loans, what is if uh, they cannot be paid back? Um, there's a default risk. Um, there's like, yeah, there, there is a, there are two risks. One is a smart contract risk. You never know if the technology really holds. Until now, it's never gonna, uh, it's never been a re big issue to the bigger protocols, which we are using like Maker, or um, compound, et cetera. Um, the second risk is if the market drops too, like normally it's like 200% uh, collateral. For example, you um, mm -hmm. um, rent out 100 US dollars, you have to at least uh, put in a collateral of 200 in, in Bitcoin, for example. Now let's imagine Bitcoin drops so quickly and there's not enough liquidity to um, liquidate it. And it could be that because of the flash crash, you cannot be compensated. Okay, okay. Seems a little bit uh, risky, risky into my eyes. Risk. It, actually, this never happened until now because it's not dropping. Like that the market drops 50% within a couple of minutes so that you cannot liquidate. Never happened in the history of the crypto market with bigger coins. Like it's not that this, like these protocols, that there's not enough liquidity on coins which have a trading volume of, I don't know, a million a day. So this is mostly just for the bigger ones, like USDC, for example, and USDT, like the stable coins, mm -hmm. they are in the top 10 of our cryptocurrencies because there's like billions in it. And most um, used for collateral is Bitcoin and Ethereum. So it's the modern version or the new version of savings and loans, basically, yeah. that, uh, that evolves around yes. with uh, higher yields on one hand, but also higher demands for collaterals to put in to yes. secure the payback. It's basically then for uh, really promising growing business models, an example to, to get loans into these business models that otherwise would not have happened. There is a lot happening in that area. There's also a, um, a lot of institutional money going in that direction, a lot of venture capital going in that direction. Um, a lot of platforms are built on that. Um, it's also still in the early phase, but I think in total, we already have over 100 billion um, value locked in this um, in this decentralized finance application. So it's not that small anymore, but it's still small compared to the, to the real market or the classic market, traditional market. Um, you also, if you like think further with NFTs, et cetera, et cetera, there are already platforms where you can, for example, put in a board ape, like uh, <laughs> one of the biggest NFT collection and use that as a collateral. And like going wider and wider and wider, that's again, a nice thing of the interoperability of all this, these platforms. I could basically use any asset as a collateral to get a loan and basically get liquidity short term. So Lombard credits, which we know from stocks, easily are replica uh, replicatable to um, DeFi protocols. People take cre uh, credits like getting a loan on a, on, a, on a house, for example, if you tokenize it, you could easily um, replicate that normal um, banking business in a decentralized finance protocol. If there's enough liquidity, if there's a market for it, then you can do it. No, I, I'm speechless a little bit. You didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's um, this reinvents the entire financial system in a way that it uh, makes it more cost efficient. 
when you think, I mean, there was how much effort and energy. I mean, you, you said in the beginning that uh, some tokens uh, consume a lot of energy, but when I think um, just about what, how much energy, uh, brain power, thinking power, and also uh, electricity is used to keep up the banking system uh, globally, uh, which only works in the Western world very well. When I think to third world countries, I mean, uh, due to some restrictions, uh, it's not possible uh, to establish an efficient banking system like we have in the Western world. Um, also, when I look as a second point uh, on the banking system, from the angle, uh, how many transactions they can handle. It's very, it's a very expensive system. From what you explained in the last two hours about uh, Solana, for example, or Ethereum, they can handle much higher transaction volume at the, at the same period of time than the traditional banking cool. system. Yes, there's limitations, but Solana, for example, can like a lot of transactions, yes. Yeah, but when I think in patients, when I, look, when, when I look at the banking system, having a transaction these days from Europe to the United States also takes ah, Yeah, for that <laughs> for that use case, yeah, that's actually the, the most inefficient process which you can imagine. <laughs> but it was the but it was the best solution available at the time it was invented. So there was were no better solutions. Mm -hmm. And now we are reinventing that with uh, with the cryptocurrency space. It's great. It's really great. Mm -hmm. And for people who want to get into the uh, crypto space without investing a lot of time for research, your team is providing the solution. Exactly. That's exactly what we do. Also, one short note on the DeFi space, which we which we just mentioned by the end. The fifth portfolio, which is currently not um, visible on the website, is exactly um, covering the thematic decentralized finance, like basically the reinvention of the financial, um, financial system. And yeah, there's a lot happening, um, a lot going on, a lot of cool stuff happening but also a lot of not so cool stuff happening because the market is still in this early phase. And I think for, for people who just want to have exposure, we have the perfect solution. That's what we are trying um, to do. Giving exposure, giving access to the market without getting people crazy about it. I have two questions left. So uh, yes. <laughs> one question is, uh, is your solution available globally or just in Austria? It's uh, available in the whole European Union. Mm -hmm. and a whole European economic area. So it's basically continental Europe plus United Kingdom, I guess. Yes, yes, exactly. That's great. Do, do we have any plans to go global? Um, currently not. We see a lot of opportunity, especially in the European market. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we are about to expand in Europe like with active um, like advertising, new products around NFTs, like real NFT exposure. But it's not yet planned that we want to expand to Asia or the US in the near future because of regulation, different economic areas. It makes our solution a bit more complicated and we see there's still a lot of potential in Europe and we want to focus on Europe. And I would like to divide the last question into two parts. One part is for the investors in the audience. If somebody wants to invest uh, in your company, are you currently fundraising or do you have any plans to raise funds in the future? So we're currently not fundraising. Um, we're currently mostly in the oper operative mode. We're expanding to um, Germany. We are expanding our product line with NFT products, but we plan to raise around later this year in August, okay. something like that. So it's possible also for investors who want to look at your company as an investment case to engage with you yes. and stay in the loop and, uh, for later this year or next year. And the second uh, uh, group of personas are the retail investors or investors who would like to buy coins without investing much time. What's the best way to engage with your company? I would say it can't be easier than just downloading the app or going to the website, register, set up. Um, in <laughs> it's so easy. That's actually hard to explain. You basically really have just to register, deposit some money, and then just start with the cautious balance of adventures, depending on how much risk you want to take and just get started. And once what's you get interested in it, you can do DeFi and um, NFT. What's the minimum amount people need to invest? I think the, currently the minimum is 50 euros. So it's even the minimum is super low. With 50 euros, you can try it out. If you like it, you can increase your position. You can set up a savings plan. So make regular deposits to one of the portfolios. So it's really ETF-like investing, but completely digitalized. You don't have to call anyone. You can do everything to the website or the web. 
So 50 euros to invest in a diversified portfolio is a paradise for people who grew up in the 90s. <laughs> so <laughs> it was not very, really possible back then with uh, such a small amount to invest in a diversified but, but diversified portfolio. Of Fractionalization finances. of um, financial instruments is happening. It's also one of the big trends currently. That's great. And the final question to you, uh, did we miss anything in this episode? Would you like to add something? Hmm. No, actually, I think we covered a lot of things. It was super exciting, dreaming a bit and exchanging ideas about how the future will look like. Um, yeah, I guess you can see I'm really passionate about the topic and uh, Absolutely. I really connect with it. I guess for, I think what people definitely should do is open their eyes a bit and also try around with the technologies. It's also fun, not always as an investing purpose, but also seeing how could the future um, look like. And just be open um, what is happening. Like a lot is happening. It's not going to be next year, but it's going to be sooner than a lot of people think. I think that's like my closing remarks. That's true. I couldn't agree more. I think the ecosystem will continue evolving and uh, it makes sense to allocate a little bit of capital into that area. Alexander, thank you very much for your time. I wish you and thank your you. team all the best and good luck for 2022. Thank you. It was great. Have a great day. Have a great day. Bye. Bye. Did you like the episode? Then please, please, please leave a five-star review on Spotify and Apple and make sure that you like, comment, and share the YouTube episode. It helps that the algorithm delivers the episode to people who also benefit from it the same way than you did. Have a great day.